So welcome back to this afternoon session. I have a short announcement concerning a change, slight change in the program. Uh, Shasha Tutupalli uh, had a problem with, uh, with his flight, so he's not able to be in uh, for today's talk at 5 p.m. Uh, he will be arriving tonight uh, in Trieste. So we have moved his talk uh, some, some time later in the week. So for today, the session ends at 5 p.m. Uh, from that time on, you will be free to roam everywhere around in, in the city. And I will give you details how to reach the city center, how to get back, and what to do in the next break. And uh, now I'll leave the floor to Dario. Okay, hi. My name is Dario Floriano. and we'll be chairing this afternoon session. The first speaker is Marco Dorigo, and um, I don't think I need to introduce him. Okay, so very nice to be here today to talk about beyond pure self-organization robot swarms. Basically, what I want to do today is to give a, a short overview of research that we have been doing in the last 15 years on uh, purely self-organized robot swarms, and, uh, on, and then conclude with some recent research on going beyond this pure self-organization approach because of what I believe are some problems that we had when using pure self-organization. Okay, so the problem, we, oh, the problem we are interested in is how to control a large number of relatively simple, simple robots that cooperate to perform a given task and that are robust to failure and uh, such that the system, in a way, so that the system is scalable. So that if you want to perform more work, you just add more robots. And um, the way you control such a large number of robots, well, there are basically two main possible philosophies. One is centralized control. The other one is decentralized, or self decentralized control of self-organization. The first one, um, you might be tempted to use it because we have a lot of experience on how to build the software for centralized systems. Um, but there is a one, there are a few problems, and one very important problem is that is the, there is a single point of failure, so your system is not that robust to failures. On the other side, when you use self-organization, there is no centralized controller. 
uh, there are local interaction between the components of the system, uh, local communication, and also the, what is good in this approach that is coherent with our goals in uh, small robotics, but we have a problem that is what is called the micro-macro problem because uh, what we want is to program a swarm or a large group of robots, but what we can do in practice is to program the single robot. So the problem is how you, do you program this single robot so that you get the swarm level behavior that you want. So swarm robotics is exactly the, this is, this is the science and the study, science and engineering that studies how to design, build, and control swarms of cooperating robots. So that using self-organization principles. And um, in a robot swarm, we have the robots that are relatively simple. There are many of them. And they are relatively simple and incapable. And they need to cooperate to perform a task that you give them. So if they do not cooperate, I don't call it swarm robotics. Okay? So if you have a bunch of robots, each one is doing things independent of each other. Uh, there are just many robots. So <coughs> I approximately already said this, but why do we want as one robotic systems? Is because we hope to be able to have a robotic system made of many simple parts that can do the same things that a much more complex robot could do. And uh, have additional desirable properties like fault tolerance, scalability, parallelism, that would be difficult to have in uh, more complex single robot. Additionally, the hope is that they can be cheaper since usually the cost of uh, an artifact grows more than linearly with its complexity. Having many simple robots might be a cheaper way to go. So in these uh, last 15 years, we have built a number of robots to, um, to do experiments in, robot, in small robotics. In particular, we have built S-bots, N-bots, high-bots, foot-bots, which I will present very briefly. The S-bot is what you see here. It's a robot that is capable of grasping other robots. Basically, that, th this is the main uh, characterizing feature. It has grippers that allow the robot to attach to other ro similar robots, and so they can perform, um, they can cooperate physically, not only logically. Okay, the robot has a, is a 12 centimeters, uh, 700 grams, and uh, has a number of capacities. It can communicate with other robots using lights, using sounds. It has cameras and so on. And they, as I said, can attach to each other uh, using the gripper, and the motors are strong enough so that they can lift another robot. Okay, so this robot can be used to, when, when they cooperate, they can do things that they cannot do alone. For example, you see here they cooperate to move on a rough terrain to pass over a rock by using these flexible uh, grippers to attach to each other. Here you see the same robots uh, attached to each other that manage to pass over a step. And here you see a number of 20 of these robots that um, grasp a child and pull it on the ground. So the child was uh, augmented with a red bar so the robots could uh, use their sensors to see the child. And then they formed four structures, which we call swarm bots, and they <coughs> Retrieve the child. Okay, so how do we program a robot swarm? So the, the basic paradigm that has been followed in the great majority of the cases, there are always ex exceptions, but this is the standard way to go, is we use an, a behavior based architecture. So if we define a certain number of behaviors that the robots should have. And then we either write or use some machine learning techniques to learn these behaviors. And then we test, we, we place the behaviors in form of controllers on the robots. Uh, but we first test the behaviors in simulation. And once we are 
happy with the results. Uh, so there are cycles until we are happy with the results. And then once we are happy, we move to test with the real robots, which are the, uh, the real test. Uh, if it works, we are happy, and otherwise we recycle. And um, to give you an example of how this works, uh, I will discuss briefly uh, a search and retrieval task that we perform with a swarm of these ice bots, the robots that I've shown before. So these robots have local sensing, so they can see robots that are close by. They are capable, as I've shown before, of physical cooperation, and they are controlled by stochastic rules. And they should cooperate to search and retrieve a heavy object. Heavy means that more than one robot is needed to move it around. In the particular case, three robots at least are needed. So what we do is we give a robot rules. So robots can be in different states, like uh, they can be free, they can belong to a virtual chain, I will explain in a moment, they can be retrieving an object. In each of these states, they have simple rules like if I see nothing, explore, and so on, that are applied with certain probabilities. In this particular case, so the way we proceeded to define this rule is the following. So what you see here is the object to be retrieved, the goal, the object should be retrieved to. These gray circles here are the robots, and each robot has this sensing distance. Okay. So at the beginning of the experiment, the robots start to move around in the environment randomly, and when they happen to see the blue color, which is the goal, the rule says that they can belong to the first element, element of a virtual chain and take a particular color, for example, green. Okay. And then the process is repeated. And so <coughs> when another robot arrives at this sensing distance from the green, can stop and become the second element of the virtual chain, okay. and so on. Um, Obviously, I am here showing only one of these virtual chain. There could be other moving in other directions. When a robot is alone at the end of a virtual chain, with a certain probability, it will give up and the virtual chain will uh, be destroyed and all the robots will be free again. Okay. <coughs> and once one chain happens to be long enough and in the right direction so that the last robot in the chain see the red, the chain is frozen and is used by other robots to, re to find and retrieve the object. Okay, so this uh, informal algorithm can be then written in a formal way using a probabilistic finite state machine that you see here, and then downloaded on a, a virtual robot in a, in, in a simulation env environment. So here is the object, uh, the goal location, sorry, and these are the objects to be retrieved. And what you see here is the algorithm that I explained before. Basically. So the robots are creating these virtual chains all the time. And um, at some point, one of the chains finds the, the object, like here. And then the other robots follow the chain and go grasp the right object and retrieve it. <coughs> OK, so this was a simulation. And when we got here, we were. Uh, confident enough that the algorithm was well conceived, and then we could go to the real robots experiment. And what you now in the next slide, I will show the, a movie of an experiment with the real robots, um, which, by the way, was performed by Rodrich Gross, that is why here in the in the audience um, when he was a PhD student. What we what I would like you to serve in the video that I'm going to show is that. All the robots have the same control system, and that they dynamically take up different roles, and they form different teams. Okay? So there will be robots that are exploring the environment, robots that are belonging to the chain, robots that retrieve, and they can join and leave this team dynamically during the experiment. So this is the arena where we run the experiment. This is the object, goal location, the robots placed randomly. <coughs> and so they start. So at the beginning, there is a lot of, since the movements and the, the application of the rules are probabilistic, probabilistic, there is kind of confusion going on. So this, for example, you see here, this chain was built up to a point and then was destroyed. Again, here, this will happen. 
this, at some point, these robots will give up, and the, train, and the robots become again uh, free. Okay? And then, as now, these robots have built a chain that connects to the other objects, and the other robots that are exploring, they don't know. And so they are just exploring, trying to extend the chain, but when they see the red object, one of their rules say, grasp it. And so the robots grasp it and then start to pull, but the object is heavy, so they don't manage to pull until there are at least three of them. <coughs> and then at some point in this experiment, the robots did something stupid because their sensing is very bad, so they don't see very well. And uh, they can see things that are not there or make error. So at this point, these robots are going away. And the other robots that are were building, trying to build chains, they fill the gap so that the robot were able to um, start again to retrieve the object. Okay, so after this experiment, we tried to go ahead and uh, do something similar, but now more complicated, working with uh, an heterogeneous worm, uh, with uh, so different type of robots that cooperate, and in three dimensions. So we built um, this heterogeneous worm that we call the swarmanoid, that was composed of three type of robots, the foot bots, the end bots, and the eye bots. They are specialized. And um, so I show them in here briefly. So the foot bot is a robot, the, the name re reminds a little bit of its function. Uh, is a robot uh, very similar to the previous one, just better engineered. Uh, it still has a gripper, but uh, is made in a way that is easier for the robot to grasp another. And its main function in our experiments was to transport other robots, these robots here. And these robots here are called the end bots. These are robots that cannot move around. They, they need to be transported but they have a gripper so that they can grasp objects and they can climb uh, some kinds of structures like this here. And finally, the eye bot that is uh, quad rotor, we, which we used in the swarm as the, uh, the robot that had the better vision capability that was helping the other robots in their exploration of the space. <coughs> so as before, we built, we, we wrote the controllers using a behavior-based approach, and then we tested the, the resulting uh, system in a, a virtual or simulated environment that you see here, uh, where these red uh, uh, discs are the model of the flying robot, and what you see here are the models of the other two, the footbots and the endbots. So basically, we let the high bot explore the environment, and when, once they <coughs> find the object, uh, they help the robot on the ground to reach the location of the object, and then the climbing robots retrieve it. Okay. So I, I go directly to show you the video with the experiments with the real robot. Swarmanoid is a heterogeneous robotic swarm made up of three types of robot. The handbot is designed to manipulate objects. The handbot can also climb, but needs help from other robots to move around. The footbot is a wheeled robot with a gripper. Using its gripper, a footbot can form physical connections with other footbots or with the handbot. The eyebot can fly and rapidly explore large areas. It can attach to the ceiling and provide environmental information to the other robots. In this film, the swarmanoid is deployed to find and then retrieve a book. Here, the swarmanoid has already partially explored its environment.
As the iBots search, successive iBots attach to the ceiling, forming a connected network. Once an iBot has found the book, the knowledge propagates back to the deployment area. The handbot then requests transport assistance from the footbots. Using the iBot network, the footbots form a ground-based chain linking the deployment area to the book. <coughs> the composite footbot handbot entity then follows this ground-based chain. A second handbot prepares for transport. The first footbot handbot entity has rotated and aligns with the bookshelf. While climbing, the handbot supports its weight with a cord attached to the ceiling. Actuated fans give the handbot control over its angle of rotation around the vertical axes. Swarmanoid is a parallel distributed system. Okay. Parallel. Um. So from these two experiments and uh, many other that we run that I don't have the time to show now, uh, well, we learn uh, first the, the one that we saw before, the one with the S-bots, was the first example of self-organized robot team formation to be proposed. And um, then we found that it was not only very difficult to obtain, uh, but it was not so easy to generalize to more complex tasks or the approach that we were following, I mean. And it was not uh, so easy to generalize the same approach to perform more difficult tasks, uh, and that the system was not so robust to failures as one could hope. For example, when you build these chains of robots, if one of the robots breaks down, then it is in the way of the other robots. Okay? So the, the, it becomes difficult to, to find a solution to this. Um, also, it is very difficult to interact with a swarm, uh, exactly because it is completely self-organized. You don't have a, someone to talk to if you want to tell something to the swarm, like giving a comment. So <coughs> before I go to the next part of the talk, I, need, I want to uh, thank all of these colleagues. Uh, the image is a little bit dark, but there are many well-known people here. Uh, some of them are also here in this audience. And, uh, the, the many PhD students that collaborated to this uh, work. Um, okay, so I was saying, because I, I somehow hit the limit, what I think uh, was the limit of self-organization, maybe I, I was not good enough, but uh, at some point I said, okay, it seems that using a pure self-organization approach might be too difficult to uh, develop a robot swarm that do something useful. I started to think what could be done next. And um, going beyond this uh, pure self-organization was uh, what I did recently by designing what I call the robots with mergeable nervous system. So the idea was to introduce some elements of a centralization 
in the organization of a robot swarm, trying not to lose the good parts of self-organization. Okay. So <coughs> um, this is some initial work, so I'm not there yet, but uh, just to give you the idea of what is the direction. So we call a robot nervous system basically the CPU and uh, all the connection between the CPU and sensor and actuators. Okay. And so uh, in the graphics that I show you in drawings I show here, the red is a robotic unit, and when there is a white circle on the center, it becomes also the brain of that particular robot. Okay. So obviously here there is only one robot, one, there is one brain. Then what happens <coughs> when you, you have two autonomous robots? So you have two robots, each one with its brain. But then you want them to connect to each other. And when they connect to each other, one of the two robots cedes authority to the other one. Okay? So basically, it's like um, I give um, my hand to someone else. And by giving the hand, one of the two brains cedes control to the other one so that we now are a single uh, being. So in this composite robot, there is one brain, and, the, and this brain has knowledge about the previous one. So basically, if you have a more complex structures, like here we have uh, six robots that are attached to each other with one brain to have here, this brain has knowledge about the body structure and the nervous system of all the body that is all the other robots that are attached to it. And this second robot here has knowledge about everything that is attached to it. Okay? So since it's a tree structure, uh, this one will have knowledge about this one and so on. <coughs> when you have two of these uh, mergeable nervous system enabled robots and they connect to each other, so since they are two MNSE enabled robots, they have each a brain and each brain has knowledge about its body. When they attach to each other, so this, this robot here was attached to this one, this robot is ceding authority to the other one, and this brain automatically gets knowledge about all the body. OK, so why is this interesting? Because in this way, we can give the robots uh, interesting capacities while retaining the capability of letting them work as a self-organized system when they are independent of each other. So for example, <coughs> we can tell robots to form particular morphologies. Okay. So if it's working, yeah. One robot is given the command to start in particular morphologies, and he knows about the structure of his body. It calls for other robots to attach, and they can self-assemble in many different ways. And it's very easy to implement. Even more interestingly, you can have uh, the merger robot act as a single entity. So for example, consider a problem in which you have robots that are reacting to an external stimulus, uh, this green light, by pointing and retracting. So they point to the stimulus, and if the stimulus is too close, they move back. So when they are independent of each other, they just do this. Then they are given the common to self-assemble in bigger robots. And now the things it becomes, for a purely self-organized system, uh, would be much more complex. Because how do you know which robot is the closest one? How do you coordinate the movement of the whole entity to move away from the stimulus? But since uh, I showed this in a video, since they are attached to each other and have this uh, nervous system, this become feasible. So these are the robots. This is a stimulus here. <coughs> okay, so now the stimulus exit, and the robots are given the um, instruction to form two MNS robots with these two brains. And, now the, and then the stimulus reappears. And you will see that the stimulus, when it reappears, uh, let 
Well, the robots are capable of pointing to the stimulus with the part of the body that is the closest one. Now the stimulus is away again, and the robots are given the command to uh, attach to each other. They become a single robot, and again, when the stimulus reappear, it is the robot is capable of to uh, perform the point and retract behavior if it, if it's as if it was a single entity. So another interesting thing that you can do with, uh, sorry, yeah, I can bypass it. Another thing that uh, you can do with, uh, have, with robots that have this uh, merger level system is uh, to let them self heal. So we have run an experiment in which one of, one, one of these uh, robots with a brain here <coughs> is broken in different parts, and then it can readjust, let's say, it can self heal. Okay, so this is the video of the experiments. In the first experiments, we basically we kill the brain. So the robots attach to each other. And now we kill the brain. Okay, so the robots that are attached to the brain, they realize that the brain is broken, they detach. They form three new robots, each one with its own brain, and then they reattach to each other, and two of them see the authority, and so the robot is basically, again, in, the, in a very similar situation as before, we've excited the broken part. Similarly here, we have a, <coughs> a composite robot where one of the components is broken, the brain realizes, moves, moves away, and then two robots are cold and the system gets repaired. Finally, <coughs> what you can do is, uh, if you have an heter heterogeneous system where you have robots that are specialized for different tasks, and uh, they need to cooperate with different configuration depending on the task they are given, they could, they can self-assemble and create bigger robots with the right components. And this is a, a very simple example in which one robot here would like to retrieve a brick here, but it has no grasping capability. So when it goes there, it realizes that the brick is there, but it has no grasping capability. It calls for another robot that has the, the gripper, but it would not be powerful enough to remove the object they attach to each other and they move away. Okay, so this is uh, some work that we have recently published in Nature Communication with these three guys here that are my ex-PhD student and Francesco Mondada that you probably know. So what we are doing now, we are trying to understand how <coughs> these uh, in part centralized uh, uh, hierarchy architecture can be, instead of being programmed, as we did the year, can be the results of self-organizing processes. So for the moment, what we have done here is to put, to create the infrastructure that make possible to do these type of experiments. And now the next step is to understand whether we can get this centralized hierarchical architecture uh, emerge through the interaction of the robots with the environment. We also intend to extend the paradigm to swarm of robots that do not physically interact with each other. So you could imagine that the same kind of merge vulnerable system approach uh, is uh, used to control a swarm of robots that are just logically interdependent with each other. Okay, so last slide. Uh, okay, obvious for time reason, I was able only to present a small part of the things that we, we do in our lab. We also have uh, activities in collective decision making in robot swarms, in stigma based on swarm construction. And uh, recently, we have uh, work on uh, the use of blockchain based as well, smart contracts to try to make robot swarm more secure and the automatic synthesis of robot swarm behaviors. So, it, since I will be here in the coming days, if you are interested in any of these uh, subjects, you are welcome to come and see me and we can discuss. Uh, any of them. 
Um, OK, so finally, just a little bit of advertising. There is a journal. Most of you are aware, but for those that are not, uh, that is called Swarm Intelligence. It's now in 12th year, so it's very well going. So you are invited to submit your papers there. And uh, if you're interested, there is the ANTS 2018 Conference on Swarm Intelligence in Rome next October. Thank you.